Well, we want to welcome you all at Miracle Mile and at Watkins Glen. Let's welcome them together now, shall we? Um, been back, this is my second message since I've been back, and I got to say it really feels good to be back in the saddle again, so to speak. Somebody sang that song, didn't they? Uh, back in, never mind, I won't do it. But uh, Linda was not ready as much as I to come back to the routine. You know, okay, I'm getting homesick, Linda. I want to go back north. And she said, oh, really? I, she wasn't so convinced. But uh, we're back here, and weather's gradually improving. And it's Palm Sunday, and we're excited, excited about the beginning of this Holy Week. Uh, we've been reminding you about the events of Holy Week, and there really are quite a few. First of all, did you all get your palms? Let me see. Raise your palms right now. I don't happen to have one right here. Very good. And that's the beginning of the week, and there's a, a bunch of things happening this week, and they are all wonderful opportunities to include Fran or Frank in your invitation. Uh, Fran is friends, relatives, associates, neighbors, and if you add the K, you get kids. So we want to be thinking of Frank and inviting Fran or Frank, uh, especially this week, is a prime opportunity to do that. Uh, we are six messages in uh, part of a seven-message series about the Apostles' Creed. And somebody asked, well, why don't we do the Apostles' Creed regularly? And I, I love the Apostles' Creed. I respect the tradition that it represents. But a, kind of a pet peeve that I had as a pastor was when you do something every week, it loses its impact. You know, you just kind of sometimes go through the, the routine or the, by rote you say something and you're not really engaging with it. So I hope that this is meaningful as we've unpacked what it is we believe, what Christians believe as expressed in the Apostles' Creed. I don't know if I shared before you, short before with you, that the Apostles' Creed originally was used on the occasion of people's conversion to faith in their baptisms. In uh, the early Catholic Church, uh, they would have a special ceremony on Easter weekend, the Saturday night of, of Easter weekend. And we think the Apostles' Creed might have been used way back in the beginning between two and 300 A.D. So it goes back a long way. And the creed, these early creeds represent the core beliefs of the church, of the Christian faith. And tradition is important. It can be appreciated. And, and we appreciate the tradition of the Apostles' Creed and the central focus on the message of Jesus Christ. And so, although we've recited this, I think, five times up until now, I'd like you to take a look at it, if you have it in your notes or if you want to look on the screen uh, let's read that together one more time. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we've attempted to address each of these key elements or components of the Apostles' Creed. And today's topic is actually the the shortest statement in the creed, and it's the forgiveness of sins. I circled that in my notes. If you want to circle that and be thinking about the forgiveness of sins, and while it is a brief statement, how important that is. Uh, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Um, when, I talk, when I thought about that this week, I was reminded of a story. Uh, this story comes from Spain, and it's about a father and a son who had become estranged from each other. The son ran away from home, and his father set out to find him. The father searched for months, but to no avail. As a last-ditch effort, the father took out a full-page ad in the Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. The next Saturday, 800 men named Paco showed up all looking for love and forgiveness from their fathers. 
Isn't that striking? You know, that I, I, we need that forgiveness, don't we? And, and we have that in, inbred desire to be forgiven uh, by our earthly parents, but especially by our heavenly Father. How many people in life walk around today looking for love and forgiveness, forgiveness from their Father in heaven? David is a key figure in the Bible. Uh, he's the man in the Bible referred to as a man after God's own heart. Some of us have been studying uh, the Old Testament just recently, and we appreciate that while David, David had that appeal before God as a man after God's heart, he also was very much a sinner as well. And I talked last weekend, if you were with us, about the difference between a sinner and a saint. And a saint is simply a sinner that's been forgiven by Jesus Christ. And David knew that forgiveness, and he wrote about it in Psalm 103, 9 through 12. This is our focus this week. This is our memory passage. Would you read with me one more time these verses from Psalm 103? He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are by of the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has removed our transgressions from us. And where is that? Psalm 103, 9 through 12. He says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? Can you answer that one? Now, Notice that he didn't say as far as the north is from the south. If David knew today's science, he would realize that the world is round. And you could measure from the north pole to the south pole. But east to west, you can't. So it's like David somehow um, knew that we had a globe that we lived on way before anybody understood. Or God maybe knew that and helped David to appreciate that. But that understanding is infinity you can go west and west and west and you never arrive you know or, or or vice versa so when we think about god's amazing forgiveness i'd like to ask you three questions related to forgiveness today uh, first of all who needs it that is who needs to be forgiven well short answer we all do um, god spoke through isaiah in isaiah 59 when it says this Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Because of the sin problem that we have, uh, we're separated from God. There is this huge rift or distance from God to us. Paul understood this in the New Testament when he said in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Because of our faith in Christ, we are forgiven. The word in the New Testament is justified or the, the noun is justification. Somebody explained that as meaning just as if I'd never sinned because of what Christ did for us. The slate is wiped clean just as if we'd never sinned because the result of sin. If God had not done for that for us is it says in Romans six twenty three, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have that wonderful good news of forgiveness and relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So the question, who needs forgiveness? The answer, all of us. Second question, will God forgive my sins? Well, I'm glad you asked. I have good news for you. you now, see, the word sin in the Greek language was a term from, from archery. When you shot the arrow and you missed, you sinned. You, hamartia was the Greek word. So to miss the mark, to miss the target is sin. And that's the understanding of what sin is for us even today. 
And how do we sin? Through our thoughts, you know, through what goes on inside us, through our words, what comes out of our mouth, and through our deeds. Thoughts, words, deeds are three ways that we miss the mark, that we sin. I have explained to you before that the word sin is kind of revealing in itself. S-I-N. We have the problem with self, I, in the middle. And anything we do out of selfishness and self-centeredness results in thoughts, words, and deeds missing the mark. So, will God forgive my sins? Isaiah says in chapter 1, verse 18, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. He will take away our sin. Isaiah lived six, seven hundred years before Jesus. But he saw what was coming to what Jesus was going to do through that justification, just as if we had never sinned. You could say that uh, if somebody made a, a tape of your life, and uh, we have a, a small congregation here. Um, Karen, I'm going to pick on you. If there was a tape made of your life, uh, good and bad, everything about you, would you, like, would you want it to be shown up front on the screen at Miracle Mile? Maybe not. Well, the good news is it's all forgiven. It's all taken away. Um, I have from time to time problems with my electric devices, whether it's my phone or my computer or my tablet or whatever. And there's a great little thing you can fall back on if all else fails. It's called the factory reset. And you can go back to where it, uh, it's all undone and you can start like you're starting from scratch again. Well, that's what God does for us in Jesus Christ is he gives us that just as if I never sinned factory reset. And we, the slate is clear. We can start again. There was a, a Christian monk who lived in the 4th century. That means he lived in the 300s A.D. And he was one of the people they called the Desert Fathers. In fact, this, uh, the man's name was Avagrius Ponticus. How many times have you ever talked about Avagrius Ponticus before? I just learned about him this week. He was also called Avagrius the Solitary. He learned a lot by being out in the desert. He is the one who first came up with a list called the seven deadly sins. Have you heard of that before? Uh, he summed up sins. Originally he had eight, but he got it down to seven somehow. But these are sins. Now just walk through them slowly. See if any of them apply to you. The first one he listed was lust. The second one, gluttony. The third, greed. Fourth was sloth. Now, sloth is a little hard to explain. As I understand it, it's uh, indifference toward evil or indifference toward other people's suffering. Anger was his fifth. Six was envy. Seven was pride. Did any of those hit home at all? Uh, he, he boiled down his understanding of missing the mark of that sin nature into those seven deadly sins. If you wanted to look that up, I'm sure you could go online and Google that and find that. The truth is all of these sins over promise but under deliver. Think about that. You know, you always have this promise of, well, if I could just give in to this temptation, if I just chase after that sin and there's an over expectation but a disappointment when you see that it under delivers. And isn't that the truth? So the question is, who needs forgiveness? All of us. Will God forgive? The good news is yes. Now, number three, in the aspect of the forgiveness of sins, do I have to forgive others? Short answer is, well, yes, if you want to be forgiven yourself. Um, somebody said this. I don't know who it was. It said, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Now, it, it's self-destructive. It eats away at us. Um, along those same lines, that contrary to that, uh, somebody made these statements. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. The first to forget is the happiest. 
So to be able to apologize, to say you were wrong when you were wrong, to forgive, and then to allow forgiveness to shift into forgetfulness. Clara Barton, uh, the woman that started the Red Cross, uh, was reminded one day of a vicious deed someone had done to her years in the past. Clara Barton acted as if she had never heard of the incident. Her friend asked, well, don't you remember that? No, came Barton's reply. I distinctly remember forgetting it. So we have to make that determination. And if we're going to let the person go and to practice that uh, forgiveness that can lead to forgetfulness, uh, that's, that's a mark of God working in our lives. Most of the weddings that I performed, I had this same illustration. So some of you, probably your lips will move as I say this, but it was Corey Ten Boom, a wonderful Christian lady who survived the Holocaust in World War II, became quite a Christian speaker. She talked about a time when she was confronted with one of the Nazi guards that had tormented Corey and her sister in, in prison in the concentration camp. And the man was coming to shake hands with her. And he had since become a Christian, evidently. And she, he's like two or three people away. Oh, God, what am I going to do? I can't shake hands with this man. God wonderfully helped her forgive right on the instant that she needed that. She later wrote about forgiveness and forgetfulness. And she said that when we confess our sins to the Lord, he forgives us. And he takes our sins and he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness and he puts up a sign that says no fishing. So no bringing it back again. So maybe forgiveness and forgetfulness are far apart for you still. But allow the Lord to work forgetfulness and it's refrain from fishing it out again, if you will. So these questions about forgiveness, who needs it? Will God forgive my sins? Do I have to forgive others? You have in your notes today the Lord's Prayer. Like the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer is something I think that is a, a powerful prayer, but I've resisted overusing it sometimes. I realize that there could be people at Watkins or Miracle Mile especially uh, or even Saturday night in Pine City, we don't pray the Lord's Prayer very often. Sunday morning at Pine City, we do. But the words are here. And I must say that when I do a wedding or even a funeral, and I invite people to join me in the Lord's Prayer, I find less and less people even know the prayer these days. Um, but the prayer is there. If you want to say it with me, uh, let's, let's do that together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Notice that uh, I took the liberty and I've done this since I've been at PAUMC of substituting the word sins for trespasses. That's the way many of us learn the prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, some people use the word debts and debtors. Um, I'm better at sinning, <laughs> say to say. Uh, so I, I like to call a spade a spade, if you will, and to just call it sin. And notice that in your notes, I left a long space next to the forgive us our sins blank as we forgive those who sin against us and in just a moment i'm going to invite you to pause for a few seconds and think about what might go in the blank for you and this is something personally between you and god nobody else has to see this page but forgive us our sins what would that be that comes to mind for you today and then forgive those who sin against us what you need to forgive that somebody else might have done to you. So would you take just a, a few moments, and um, I'll, I'll call us back together, but let's just be silent before the Lord for a moment and think about forgiveness 
and how that applies to our sins and the sins of others. Let's be silent before the Lord. Amen. Now, as we pray that prayer, we're asking God to forgive us in the same way that we forgive those other people. That's a pretty scary thing, isn't it? If, if you have an issue there, uh, you need to resolve that and, and not allow that poison to, uh, as, as I said earlier, you drink the poison and you watch the other person die. No, it's going to eat you alive. So this matter of forgiveness can make us bitter or better depending on how we allow it to work in our lives. Let us pray together. Thank you, Lord, that we do believe in the forgiveness of sins. Give us a renewed appreciation for what that means, even as we look at this week to come and what Jesus did and how he experienced uh, the last days of his life and what he went through on our behalf. May we avail ourselves of the forgiveness that he would offer us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen.